Father, bless these words. Wow, thank you for this time so far in music. Uh, you offer a good offering by Pat. Really heartfelt. And Lord, uh, just anoint these words. Uh, minister to the hearts that are here. Christ's name. Amen. Um, I don't know if, if you're like most people and uh, you've read the Beatitudes before. Uh, they tend to be a group of verses that people read and kind of pass over without really thinking about them too much because they seem to be talking about a group of people that we are not. And uh, we wonder maybe sometimes, well, who is he talking about? Uh, who can do the things that the Beatitudes are talking about? And, and so we kind of just pass them by. Uh, nice words, uh, a good thought, but it's really not, not me. It's not really uh, applicable to to who I am, so I thought it would be good to kind of go over them a little bit today and see some things. So in Matthew 5 verse 1, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into the mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, blessed, and we'll stop there. Because uh, we need to talk about the word blessed. But just a note on this. Who was he talking to? Yeah, was he talking to the multitudes or his disciples? If you read it carefully, he's talking to his disciples. Like he saw the multitudes, so he went up in a mountain. And, and then when he was set, or got settled, he called his, his disciples came to him. So it doesn't really matter, but it's just interesting. I think he was talking to his disciples. So those are following. But the word bless. Uh, if we asked ourselves today, you know, Mike Bonaparte used to come here and he used to, he was in Sargas, he's a good friend, and he used to always say when I would see him, I'm a blessed man. You know, was one of his favorite sayings, I'm a blessed man. So I say, why, Michael, are you a blessed man? Like, because I have, you have a nice house, you have a wife, you have kids, you, you drive a nice car, you know, uh, all this stuff. Well, yeah, that's part of it, but he was, he was a blessed man because he said he knew Christ as a savior. Uh, and so that made him a blessed man. So when we, we talk about being blessed, we all pray and we want to be blessed, but our concept of being blessed tends more to be towards the outward things of life. You know, uh, if I got a good job, I would consider myself blessed by God. If, if I had a new car, I would consider myself blessed by God. All these things of a nice family and all that. But if you don't have those things, are you blessed by God? Can you be blessed by God? just as much, or maybe even more. Like, can, a, can, a, can a, 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 a homeless person be blessed by God? Would they consider themselves blessed by God? It depends on the person and their outlook, and what they mean when they say, I'm blessed. And the Beatitudes here, the word blessed is talking more, it has both meanings, uh, uh, the, the uh, experience of having an outward blessing upon your life, as we just shared, but it also talks about having an inward blessing, which is not dependent upon external circumstances. Like, I can be blessed without having a good job. I can be blessed without having a fine home. I can be blessed, you know, with all those things. Uh, still, without having all those things, I could still consider myself a blessed man. And so, in the Beatitudes, uh, the word blessed, it, which is used over and over, is going after an inward manifestation of something, of God, really, uh, in, in a person's soul. So keep that in mind as, as we read here. Uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are the poor in spirit. And that's a, it's the, the words in this portion is amazing because they they challenge our concepts of things because if we never look at the at people who are poor as blessed, uh, we don't consider that a blessing. And yes, it says poor in spirit, but but the, as a Christian, aren't I supposed to be uh, rich in the things of God? Yes, uh, we're called to be rich in the in the things of God which is the Spirit. When I have the Spirit of God, um, I have all the riches of Christ in me, in Ephesians. And exceeding great and precious promises, like more promises than I can handle, what you would call rich. Rich in promises, all of these things. But so what does it mean to be poor in spirit? Uh, a poor in spirit person is a person who doesn't think much of themselves. Uh, not that they have a poor self-image, they just know who they are outside of Christ. They know what it means um, to be called a sinner, because they are a sinner. And they know that. They don't have a false pretense of, oh well, I do sin, but I'm a good person. Uh, if you think of it in these terms in the church, of Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3, um, that's one of the admonitions Christ gave to that church. He says, you think you are rich and you see, but you don't know that you are poor and blind and naked. And he goes, and, and because of that, and because of that, they were neither cold for the Lord or, or hot for the Lord, they were lukewarm. And Jesus said, I will spew you out of my mouth. Uh, because you are lukewarm. But they needed to know that they were poor in spirit. And we all need to know that we're poor in spirit. Apart from, from Jesus Christ um, energizing my spirit and hooking up with my spirit, then my spirit is poor. And yet there's so many in the world that will not or they refuse and they don't want to look at themselves that way because they classify it as having a poor self-image. If I say that I'm poor in spirit in the world, then people will say you should have a better image of yourself. Uh, if your image of yourself isn't derived and based in Christ as a frame of reference, then you should have a poor self-image of yourself. We all should. Because we'll, what is it the Bible say about us outside of Christ? There's none to do with good, no, not one. Uh, we are, all, our righteousness is like a filthy rag. Uh, we have putrefying sores from the sole of our foot to the top of our head. This is the viewpoint of the human nature apart from Christ. And yet the world is, is on the opposite side of it, saying, no, excel and strive and make, be the better person that you are. And there's even preachers saying that from the pulpit. Be all that you can be. Be the better person. You know, the prosperity message. You can do it. You know, pull up your bootstraps. You can do it. No, I can't. If I recognize that I can't, I'm a sinner. When it comes to the things of God, I'm poor in spirit. I don't have what it takes um, to, to be in the presence of God. And I don't have what it takes. Like, like Pat was saying, you know, uh, there's days you don't want to go out of your house. It's honesty. And you say, well, well he's, he shouldn't have, feel that way. Well, why shouldn't he feel that way? That's who he is outside of Christ. And he even said it. But when I think about the church and I think about Christ, I'm able to do it. So, yet there are people in the world that don't even think that way. They just get up and do all they do, all these things. They're good for them. Good for them. But they still need to recognize that they're poor in spirit. The church at Laodicea, they were able to get up and go out and do all that without God, and they thought they were all that. But they weren't. They, weren't, they were not poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit who recognize that they need help. That they don't, they're not rich without Christ. They don't have what it takes. And so they're blessed. And theirs is, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, that's what the kingdom of heaven is made up of. People who know their core in spirit. You know? 
You, know, you, you will not find rich people in heaven who don't have Christ. You won't find anybody, of course, that don't have Christ, but, but people don't, you know, who try and make their way based on their security and their riches. I don't just mean money, I just mean their mindset of the way they view themselves. They're not poor in spirit. You know, David was, was very rich. We've been doing the Psalms class. David was very rich king. He had gazillions of wives and concubines and sheep and goats and palaces and all this. Solomon exceeded him in his riches, but David was very rich. Yet David said over and over again in the Psalms, I am poor. I am poor. And that's what he was talking about. He was poor in spirit. He knew who he was outside of Christ. He knew uh, his, that there was nothing he had to offer God, uh, regardless of how much money he had. So the next one in verse 4, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. You know, this is not talking about mourning over the loss of a loved one that happens. We all mourn over people who have passed on. We've all experienced that. There's not one of us that escapes the feeling of mourning when we lose somebody we love. Uh, that's a real emotion and we're not talking, it's not really talking about that. It's talking about, it kind of goes with the first part, poor in spirit and the, mourn, the one who mourns. Mourns what? Mourns the fact that they're sinners. Mourns the fact that they've offended God. Mourns the fact that, that they really are enemies of God in Romans chapter 5. While we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. Uh, mourns like Paul mourned in Romans 7, and he said, O oh, wretched man that I am. What was he doing? He was mourning over his old sin nature that kept coming up in his life, even though he was now a Christian. And, and, and sometimes we as Christians, we, we forget about all that. We become saved and, and that's good and we should know this and know our new identity, but then we forget about, about mourning over sin. And we just excuse sin because we have grace. You know, oh, you know, there's grace so I can sin. And when I sin, there's grace. So, like, doesn't the Bible say to go on? Yes, it does, but there has to be that that mourning over your sin in your spirit that you know that this isn't right. I have offended God. I have, I have um, um, gone back to the way of Cain. I have gone back to the way of Balaam. I have gone back to the Adam nature and I have entered into sin again And because I'm a sinner. But I mourn that fact. I, and, and, and it turns into, uh, like I always say to people, you want to know if you're really saved? Like people want to know, I, I, I really want to know if I'm saved. Do you hate sin? When you hate sin, you are saved. Because if you're not, if you don't hate sin, you're probably not saved. And I don't mean like when you get mad and you decide, I don't care, I'm going to say those, those words that I don't say anymore. And that, and, but then you feel bad about it afterwards. You know, I'm not talking about that, I'm talking about it as a lifestyle. Like you have no regard for sin in your life at all. And you got saved and, and you say you're a believer but you still sin up a storm and you don't even care. Like it doesn't affect you. Like if Christ hasn't had an effect on you it, that it causes you to mourn over the fact that you were sinned or you've sinned and you can get, yes we can get right and we can repent and God does not want us living in the effects of our sin? Absolutely. But if we don't have this mourning over the fact that we're sinners and we've offended God, something's wrong. Something's wrong. And those who do mourn over their sin, we're not told to keep mourning over it. Like remember the story of, of, of uh, Saul and Samuel and, 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 and you know God rejected Samuel from being king and and I mean from Saul from being king and Samuel was mourning over it and God came to Samuel and said how long are you going to mourn? I rejected him from being king. Get up. And I have another king I want you to pick. Mm -hmm. And it's like us, a picture of us with our sin sometimes. We, 
we sin and we fail and we enter into condemnation and we sit there at our houses and we feel like I can't do anything for God, I'm no good, I'm this and that. And God's like, no, no, no. You know, you mourned over your sin, now get up and go forward for me. I don't want you staying like that, but there has to be this, this sense inside of us that sin is not good. Sin is not what God wants me to do, and sin can't be excused because there's grace. Grace is not an excuse to sin, it's a power to not sin. It's a power that's greater than sin. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Uh, it gives me the power to say no, but it doesn't give me an excuse to keep doing it. And so my viewpoint on sin is key, and I'm blessed when I have a viewpoint that I mourn over sin. You see, that's what it's saying. Blessed are they that mourn, <clears throat> for they shall be comforted. What's my comfort? My sin was paid for. Thank you, Jesus. Christ came and died for that sin that you're mourning over. Uh, so you don't have to stay that way. You can rejoice. <clears throat> Isaiah 61, uh, that God came to comfort those who mourn. That was his ministry. And through his his uh, redemption and through his blood, uh, we are able to, uh, we don't have to mourn any longer. And there's a day coming uh, when we will no longer sin at all. We will have a new, new nature, a, a glorified nature, uh, when the rapture happens and we will never sin again and we won't have to mourn over it. The mourning will be gone for good. And so uh, we will be comforted. We are comforted now because there's a mediator between God and man, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the great intercessor. He ever liveth to make intercession for us when we fail and when we sin. And so we're comforted by that. And then we will be comforted once and for all when he comes back. So then the next one. <clears throat> Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, all of these kind of go together if, you, if you're thinking about it now, right? Poor in spirit, mourning, and now meek. And we did, a, we did this in our Psalms class a few weeks ago. What, is, what does it mean to be meek? We wrote on the board, you know, what your definition of meek is, you know? And then, then we asked us, are you meek? Like a person who doesn't say, you know, uh, my name's Jim and I'm meek. No, we don't do that. But somebody can call you meek. Like someone say, hey, you know Pat, he's a great guy, you know, he's kind of meek. And Pat might get offended and then, what do you mean I'm meek? Because the, the world's definition of meek is not God's definition of meek. You know, the world looks at meekness as weakness, as manby pamby type stuff. He won't say a word to anybody. He can let people walk all over him. You know, he's, he's, a, he's a nice guy, but you know, he's meek. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not saying that. I know you, you've got a gun and everything. No. But, you know, I'm just using him as an example because he was there. But uh, we could apply that to any one of us, right? And then there's some people you would look at and say, they're not meek, you know. You know, like, when I first met Big Fran, I never thought he was meek. You know, he was, though. That's the thing. He was in the new creation. He was meek, uh, 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 but in in the, the old life, he was he wasn't meek according to our definition of meekness. You know, far from it. But <clears throat> we read this thing, and I want to read it again. It's, I shortened it somewhat for the sake of this message. But it's the definition of meekness, and I thought it was like one of the best definitions I ever came across. So I'll share it with you, <clears throat> because it's important for us to have the right idea about what meek is, you know. So, <clears throat> meekness is the soulful state of grace that sees God in the big picture of life and recognizes that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose, Romans 8.28. <clears throat> Meekness inspires us to say with Paul, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and mean it not as a boast, but as a confidence. Mm -hmm. Think of meekness as a bold humility 
or an assertive patience. It is the spiritual discipline that overcomes the world. To be meek in the biblical sense is to be neither mousy nor militant. Uh, it strikes the mean between being passive and pushy, cowardly and reckless, lenient and harsh. Meekness is a one-word summary of greatness, but not as the world defines greatness. Remember, <clears throat> David said his gentleness has made me great. You know, meekness is gentleness. It's not weakness. It's not being a pushover. It's, it's knowing who you are in Christ without thinking that you're all that. You know what I mean? That's what meekness is. So I, I, I can go into situations and actually have confidence, and that's meekness, because I know who I am in Christ. I'm secure and who he has made me to be. And so <clears throat> I don't have to be bullied, and I don't have to be a pushover, <coughs> excuse me, uh, because I, I'm meek in Christ. But it's really a confidence that makes me great. Uh, and I don't, it's not cockiness at all, and it's not arrogance, and it's not conceit. It's just having the security and knowing that I belong to Christ, and that nothing can happen to me unless he allows it. And that I am able to get through things because of Christ, not because I'm, I'm all that. You know. So meekness, we are blessed uh, when we know we're meek, for we will inherit the earth. You know that we are going to inherit the earth? The meek will inherit the earth. And you say, oh, the earth's going to be a bunch of pushovers. No. <laughs> the earth's going to be a bunch of glorified saints who are running, running things on the earth. You know that. During the millennial reign, guess who runs things on earth? The meek. The, the ones who are in Christ. Blessed are the meek. When we, when we operate in the, in the meekness of who we are in Christ, guess what goes away? Egos. Hmm. Egos go right out the door. Nobody has an ego when you're meek. You don't need one because you're secure in who you are in Christ. I don't need to be glorified. I don't need to be called out. I don't need to be to be even be built up about measure. I'm edified, yes, edify me all day long. I love it, and so don't you. And nothing wrong with being edified in love in the body of Christ. But to have false flattery and to be falsely built up and everything, uh, a meek person does not need that. I don't need a compliment. Uh, to know who I am in Christ. I'm secure in who I am in Christ. And all that goes away when you have the proper meekness in your life. We are blessed when we have meekness. And then the next one, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Hunger, and this is, might be one of the Beatitudes you read and go, that's not me, so I'm out. You know, I don't hunger and thirst after righteousness. What does it mean to hunger and thirst after righteousness? David, I'm, I'm making a lot of references to the psalm class because it's been so good in teaching us these concepts like David in Psalm 42, not David, I'm sorry, one of the guys that was with him, the sons of Korah, right in that psalm, uh, what he said in verse 2, he says, my soul thirsts after God. And we were talking about how we can all relate to being thirsty in our lives. But then you have a soul that thirsts after God. And the only thing that will quench that thirst is God. But the world, the devil, has given us other things to try and quench the thirst. Uh, sin, pleasures in the world, lusts, uh, all kinds of lusts. And things that say, if you have this, if you can only get that, if you get what, see that commercial, if you get that, that's going to be you. And it's going to quench your thirst that you have to be a better person, to have success, to be the talk of the crowd. No, it won't. My soul thirsts after God. Song of Solomon, uh, it talks about the woman who is searching for him whom her soul loveth. And that's Jesus Christ. And our soul has to have a thirst that's after God. A thirst speaks of a need. Like you, you can't live without, you can live without food for a while, but you can't live for, without water for very long. You, you, your body needs it. And our soul craves, it thirsts after the things of God. 
And like in John 4, uh, the woman at the well, Jesus said, if you knew who it was that you were talking to, he would, you would ask of me and I would give you waters that would make you never thirst again. You know, and, and she couldn't understand that, but he was talking about his life. You know, my soul thirsts after the life of God, and I hunger after him, and hunger speaks of uh, a continual nourishment. Like I need the word of God every day, like manna that comes down every day. I need a portion every day. I need to hear from God every day. Do you know that even in Christianity today, like we're blessed in this church because we hear the word of God. It's preached all the time. <coughs> and there's other churches that do it. But there's a lot of churches even today in the world, especially, are dying from a famine of the word of God. And it's everywhere. It's available everywhere. I have it here in this Bible. I have it on my iPad. I can pull out my phone and I have it on there. And the average American has something like seven Bibles in their house or in their possession through, through uh, electronics or in their house. And, and, not, and I'm not bragging or anything like that, but I, I think I might have ten Bibles in my house, you know, over the years. There's different Bibles. Okay, so there's an abundance of the Word of God. Everybody, you can go to Barnes and Nobles and read the Word of God. There's a section, and they got Bibles there. There's nobody that has an excuse in America that says, "I don't know how to get a hold of the Word of God." You can go, hey, hey Google, show me where to get the Word of God. They won't give you the Word of God, but they'll tell you where to go to, to read it. That it's in the Bible. But, but you know what I'm saying. You know, and, and so we, we can have that hunger met, we can have that thirst met. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, which is the Word of God, which is God. That's what we're craving, that's what we're desiring, that's what we want to hear. So guess what? That's why we go to church on Sunday. That's why we missed going last Sunday, because we weren't together. The body of Christ, the righteousness in each one of us, which is the presence of God, uh, and the fullness of him that filled all in all, and, and the words that we have to hear and listen to. But in America, in the world, it's spreading. There's, there's people that have never heard the word of God. And there's a famine of it because of ignorance. It's not because it's not there, it's because of ignorance. You know, um, Richard Wurmbrandt, in his book, uh, Tortured for Christ, was in a Romanian communist prison for 10 years and he was tortured every day uh, for believing in Christ and he wouldn't renounce them. And he tells a story about how, you know, every once in a while somebody would smuggle in like a little piece of the Bible, like one scripture, one or two scriptures and they would memorize it and pass it around and then if they got caught with it they would be beaten severely so they memorized it. And, and it was in their, their mind. I, but that's a, all they had was like one verse. And we're like, oh, I don't know what to read today. I got so much to read, but I don't know, God, like, ugh. And they would take that one verse and they would just chew on it and meditate upon it. They thirsted and hungered after it. And they would talk about it to each other because it got smuggled in. And, 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 and that's how the, they kept the word in their heart. It was precious to them. The word was precious to them. And even though outwardly there was a famine of it because it wasn't available in the prison, but it was precious to them. There wasn't a famine of it in their heart. So we're blessed when we have this hunger and thirst after the things of God, the righteousness of God. It says we will be filled. Even if I only have one verse, it can fill me. And then the next one, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Another one where we look at that and go, that's not me. I'm not very merciful. Especially if you cut me off. Especially if you do me wrong. Especially if you do this. Do you know that mercy has nothing to do with whether people do anything to you or not? And for some reason, we've all made it this thing, a condition like, well, I'll, I'll show them mercy if they show me that they want it. It's no longer mercy. Oh, I'd show them mercy if they would act a little bit contrite, you know. And I'll be more than happy to give them some mercy. So I'm done withholding it. I just want to see something from them. 
It's, it ceases to be mercy. Right? If God did that with us, we'd, he'd still be waiting. In Romans 5, again, it, while we were yet his enemies, in the expanded translation, it says, while we were in the act of sinning, Christ came and died for us. He didn't wait for us to say, okay, I think I'll stop sinning so God will come and show me mercy. I said, I'm going to show you mercy. Mercy rejoices against judgment. And mercy be not getting what I deserve. You know, the mercy of God. And I, I, I don't know how many times we have this viewpoint of mercy like, well, oh, God will give me mercy if I repent. Where does it say that? It doesn't. But I'm not saying it doesn't say to repent. Of course it does. We should repent. But I'm saying to base mercy on repentance or to base mercy on anything it ceases to be mercy. So, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Well, I thought I already did receive mercy. Yes, you did. We did. After our sins, we received mercy. God died for our sins without us asking Him to. God died for our sins of the world, whether we receive it or not. Many of us have received it. Some have not. He still died for their sins. That's mercy. No, there's no payment. There's no required that it was paid for. There's nothing required in order to get mercy. He just gives mercy because he's God. Bless. So then I get mercy from God, and then God says, well, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain more mercy, or mercy. And so mercy is kind of like a twofold thing. I have received mercy, but then God says, well, now you can be merciful, because you have received mercy. It's the same principle with forgiveness. Forgive because you've been forgiven. You know, well, I don't want to forgive. But you should forgive because you've been forgiven. Uh, does, it doesn't say you have to forgive. It says you should forgive because you've been forgiven. And a person who can't forgive does not really understand what they've been forgiven for. Because if we would understand what we've been forgiven for, it would be easy to forgive people who have wounded us. Uh, we don't really understand how we wounded Christ, how we wounded God. What our sins did to him. We don't understand that, so we have a problem forgiving people. But if we do understand that, forgive because you've been forgiven, then we have the same principle of mercy. I have been given mercy. I, can be, I, can, I have been shown mercy. I can give mercy. And if I give mercy, and God says this as a promise and a blessing, if I give mercy, I will be shown mercy again. Meaning, <clears throat> it's going to come back around to me. Like, there's, do you know that there's days coming in your life where you need mercy again? You do. The next time you fail, the next time you sin, the next time you enter into condemnation, <clears throat> the next time you can't get your way out of a situation no matter what, God's going to show you mercy again and again. And you go, well, I think His mercy is going to run out with me. It's not. It's not. He will always show you mercy. So blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy. The next one, blessed are the pure in heart, <clears throat> for they shall see God. Very simply, who in this room is pure in heart? Could anybody raise their hand and say, my heart is pure? No. None of us can. We cannot say that our hearts are pure before God. But we can say it if we're in God. God's heart is pure. Christ's heart is pure. So we're blessed because uh, we have the purity of the heart of Christ. We're blessed because our consciences have been made clean by, the, by our sin through the blood of Christ, which means that they're pure. My conscience is pure. Do you have a guilty conscience today? Did you have one the last time you did something wrong and, and you felt guilty about it? You have a guilty conscience? Yes. All right. But guess what? When the, because of the blood of Christ, your conscience is made pure before God. And then again, like, like the, the, the perfect body, there will come a day when uh, we'll be pure before God all, then we'll, uh, all the time because sin will be gone. Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Okay? For you and I to say that my heart is pure requires faith. And there's no sight, there's no evidence, there's no behavior, there's no nothing in your life that you can point to and say, I'm pure. 
Can a man, in Psalms again, and can a man say, I am pure for my sin? No, he cannot. No one can. And we know it. But in order for me to say, yes, I'm pure in heart, I have to believe this, I have a new heart. I'm pure in heart because I have a new heart. And my new heart doesn't sin. My old heart, all the time, my new heart doesn't sin. Doesn't sin. Those who are in Christ do not sin. Believe it or not. I believe it because God said it. There's no evidence of it. But in Christ I am pure. So let's finish up here. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. All right? Do you know that you are a peacemaker today if you have Christ in your heart? Yes, you are. You're a peacemaker. Because until we had Christ in our heart, we didn't even know what true peace was. Because we couldn't have peace, the peace from God, the peace that passes understanding, until Christ came into our heart and set us free from our old sin nature. We had a false peace in our old nature. A, a, a compromise of peace, if you will, a, a, a peace that can, can always be broken uh, and violated. But in Christ, the peace passes understanding, which means like it never goes away. And then because I have that peace, I can share that peace. Why are you so happy? Why do you have so much joy? Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you about the peace I have in my heart. I, I, I can't explain it. it, it just happened, I invited Christ in and I have peace now. That's one of the greatest things that Christians say when, of a testimony. So I don't know what happened, but I have peace now. Guess what, you are a peacemaker. You can make peace with other people. You can bring peace to other people. You can share that peace with other people. That's what this verse is talking about. You're blessed uh, because you will be called the children of God. And the last one, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you notice, that's the, the reward of the first blessed one, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This last one uh, is speaking of all of them. The blessed are those who are persecuted. Who is, who is persecuted today? The people who have all those other characteristics wow. are persecuted because of those characteristics. Because the world does not know those characteristics. So this isn't talking about one person or two people or five people who have one or two or five of these. This is talking about a group of followers of Jesus Christ and as a result of them, you have all of them. You have all of them because, uh, go back to last week's message, because you're receiving new wine into a new wineskin. You have been, been new in Christ, and you are complete in Him, and He has new life for you, and this is the new life in them. To be a peacemaker, to be merciful, to be poor in spirit, to mourn over your sin, uh, to, do, to thirst and after righteousness and hunger after the things of God. All of those things are part of the new wine and the new wineskin. It's a result of it. He's speaking to His own here and these things, and He's saying, you are blessed. Remember what we started with on the inward. It's an inward blessing. You are blessed beyond belief. Uh, the, the best blessing you can get is the blessing of all these things being inside of you. And, and, and this is who you are in Christ. And, and you can't look at external circumstances and say, well, I don't do that. And I haven't done this. And I haven't done that. Guess what that is? That's new wine trying to fit into an old wine skin. I'm trying to say, well, I have to be mercy in my old sin nature. You can't be. I have to be poor in spirit. You won't be. You won't do all of those things in the old man. You can only do it in the new creation, in the new wineskin, and you receive it in there. And so what happens as a result of that is that you end up being persecuted by the devil, by the world, by your own sin nature. And you'll be condemned and, and, and mocked at when you don't live in any one of those things. And so don't look at that, your external thing, because that's not what the blessing is about. The blessing is knowing who you are in Christ. Like, have that meekness about it. I know I'm not none of these things outside of Christ, but in Christ, he says I'm all of these things because of who he has made me to be. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Okay, Father, um, thank you for this time.
want to pray if anyone's watching or here in this room they've never received you as their Lord and Savior, Lord, that you would, they would do that today. Uh, we made it pretty clear uh, it is about knowing Christ, having Christ as your Savior. You cannot do any of these things we talked about in the old. You can try for a while, you might do it for a little bit, but to have it as part of your heart, as part of who you are on a consistent basis, to have it just come out of you because that's who you are now, this new wine being put into a new wine skin, and the life is coming out of you. Lord, you can be merciful, you can be meek, you can have a poor in spirit, you can mourn over sin, you can thirst, you can be a peacemaker. All of these things are inside of us now in the new creation. Lord. If there's anybody here today who never received Christ, I would encourage you to do so. Ask them to come into your heart be your Savior. That's where it all starts. Just ask them. Just say, God, I'm asking you to do a difference in my heart. I receive you as my Savior. You're watching, you say that. Uh, that's all it takes is to ask God to, to, to come into your heart and be your Savior. And he will do it. He is faithful. And Lord, we love you today. We pray you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's stand.